if you look at um, you know what what science is trying to do is it's not all that different from a, a blockchain in terms of it's it's a consensus mechanism it's a truth finding uh, tool and by the way it could be corrupted like we all know that there are ways to to kind of corrupt uh, a blockchain right you can do a fifty one percent attack there are kind of like MEV type vectors there are all sorts of ways to kind of corrupt the truth of a chain and so we're trying to design bottom up censorship resistant uh, truth machines that are uh, essentially incorruptible or have a high cost to corrupt. It sounds like the consensus mechanism that science is using is good and has brought us to a certain point, but it has some corruption vectors. Like crypto listeners will be familiar with this term gamed, okay? And so like, it sounds like what you're saying is the citation method, which is basically how truth rises to um, the forefront how the consensus machine of science says, okay, this paper is uh, the accurate one. That's been corrupted by influences of capital, which is very interesting. And like, I I'm just wondering if you could kind of define a little bit more, flesh out the modern system of science, because you you've used terms like uh, citations and like journals and that kind of thing. I'll give you like my rough sense of it. It, it seems like um, the the government, this is a total layman, I know, I know very little about kind of how this system works. So that's why I'm, I'm throwing it out there, Patrick, for you to kind of react to. But it seems like the um, in, in the early days of science, kind of the main funders of science, you need, you need capital and you have a truth finding mechanism, but the main capital sources were like patrons, like rich people, lords and, you know, kings and these types of things, right? Now we've moved to this modern age, it seems like the main funders of science are public institutions. So it would be like our government, uh, the NIH. Maybe there's some commercial uh, funding of, of science involved in there, but largely kind of public. And then our consensus mechanism uh, for finding truth is this citation. Uh, so, so you have scientists that write kind of papers. Those papers are like peer reviewed. And then the more citations you get, it kind of like moves up the page rank algorithm. In fact, I think this is maybe how Larry Page designed uh, like Google at the very early phases, like inspired by the scientific consensus mechanism. And the, the stuff that rises to the top, well, we call that science. We call that truth. We call that a peer reviewed uh, study. And like, that's good. That's the, the golden stuff. And what you're saying is in that process, there's crept in some money, some capital, some corruption, some gamifying of the system. So we're not actually actually getting truth, we're getting some sort of third party's biased form of truth. And they're doing this to bend the rules and uh, like to their advantage, because there's some economic uh, advantage. I, I, I'm just throwing this out there. Is this kind of like a rough picture of, of what uh, the, the, the science um, like system looks like today? Yeah, I, I think you absolutely nailed it. And, and really, it's uh, there are a lot of great analogies there where I would say that science, you know, within the last like 10 to 20 years has done a lot of SEO. Where, you know, maybe the initial <laughs> page rank algorithm doesn't work quite as well as it used to because there's a lot of money on the line mm -hmm. and individuals within this system, you know, want to maximize their ability to receive money in the future. So scientists have done SEO on their work and they're, you know, generating more like uh, clicks and, you know, therefore citations. Um, and the result is that like the end Google search results are less valuable than they were 20 years ago because of this sort of self-awareness. And really the, the term is Goodhart's Law. So the idea mm -hmm. that a measure uh, ceases to be a good measure when it becomes a target for behavior. Mm -hmm. So scientists, they're really bright people. Um, and there's this hyper competitive job market where uh, less than 2% of first year PhD students become research professors. So in, in order to succeed as a scientist, you have to do almost anything you can to just be a part of that 2% that can get to the next level. And one of the things you have to do to be there is to optimize your outputs in order to become eligible for funding. So yeah, I think your, your um, page rank algorithm is like a great analogy and is exactly what's happening in science today. So I'm going to guess, Patrick, does this lead to maybe like three outcomes? This is just kind of a guess on my part. But like one is bad capital allocation. So we're funding the wrong things or we're like inefficient in the things that we're funding. They're not actually like achieving uh, good outcomes. Number two, like maybe this also uh, leads to bad science. So actual science that's kind of not truth. And then number three, does this also lead to like poor incentives? So we're not getting our best and brightest. Our best and brightest in our society are going and, and they're working and, you know, they're, they're in the Facebook ad department, right? And they're making 500K salaries and they're, they're not scientists competing for that Nobel Prize. Is it those three? Are there other things? 
Yeah, I, I think those are three great categories, and I have a lot of stories that kind of em embody them. I, I think the first is like the concept of negative results. Are you guys familiar with this term? The idea is when you're like dreaming up an experiment, you have a hypothesis, and like oftentimes you're wrong about the world. Your hypothesis is not supported by the experimental data that you produce. This is considered a negative result. Um, if you look at the entire uh, body of scientific literature, the uh, proportion of papers that uh, convey negative results has gone down from, I think it was like 40%-ish in the 1990s, and now it's only 20%-ish uh, of all papers are actually like display negative results. And when you look at this, it like actually comes down to people who are worried about their careers. Um, there have been meta scientists who have done studies that have found that, you know, negative results, they just aren't that exciting. So when you publish them, other scientists are like, oh, yeah, cool. Like, I knew this, you know, like, no need for me to cite this or share this with my friends. <laughs> when positive results are oftentimes, you know, just straight up more interesting and more likely positive to come results across are sexy. Negative experiment. results aren't sexy. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so it turns out that it actually hurts your career as a scientist if you share mm -hmm. a negative result. So if huh. you conduct an experiment, it doesn't match your hypothesis. You're actually better off in your career not sharing it because you <laughs> reduce your ability to receive funding in the future by sharing you're a negative a narc. result. You're a scientist exactly. narc. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, they call it the desk drawer problem because you get these negative results and you're just like, whoops, I'll put that in here. You know, nobody needs to know. And kind of the end result is that, like, uh, you know, there's a lot of knowledge that's not shared with the world. And it's due mm. to this kind of broken incentive structure and, and really, like, as you mentioned, Ryan, like poor capital allocation that reduces the efficiency of how we as a society are able to convert, you know, one dollar to one unit of new knowledge. Well, Brian, that sounds yeah. like a a broken market and a broken incentive uh, scheme right now. And crypto knows a thing or two about that. What what would you add to the to to that, Brian? <clears throat> yeah, well, I think what we're referring to here is a culture of risk aversion. So, yeah, I've talked to scientists who say, you know, I basically figure out if the thing is going to work. And then I apply for the grant to the NIH or whatever, because <laughs> I need to make sure that the things that I apply for grants demonstrate success um, so that I can get the next one and the next one. And mm -hmm. imagine if you were in, you know, the startup world in tech startups and, you know, you were going to pitch for seed financing or your series A or something. And you were like, well, I know that it has to work. Um, otherwise, I won't even apply for it because uh, the shame or embarrassment or whatever of having it not work. I mean, most seed investors in tech or series A investors, they expect two thirds, 80%, 90% of their portfolio to essentially round down to zero. And they're it's a hits driven business, right? So that's kind of like the culture in, in tech and startups is you try really ambitious things. You know that most of them are not going to work because you're trying to get breakthroughs. And in science, the culture has become risk averse and it's basically trying to do incrementalism um, and dress it up you know, or shoehorn it into whatever you can get funding for. Like, oh, the Department of Defense has a big budget. How can I dress this up to make make some argument that it's going to help defense when I actually want to be researching something entirely different? So hmm. it is a broken, the, yeah, the incentives are broken. Um, it's also like the people who make these breakthroughs don't get some big upside if it gets commercialized. And so you get people publishing papers on things which I think, you know, have no help of, no hope of ever actually improve, you know, reducing human suffering or turning into some kind of product. Um, they're just sort of, um, you know, off in, in La La Land, like in some of these papers, like make absolutely no sense to why they're getting funded. So anyway, um, yeah, risk aversion, NIH, like it's like if, if you were going to go in and try to sell something to the government, it's like, you know, IBM would win that contract or like it's no, you know, people in the government, they're, they're allocating other people's money. So um, it gets allocated based on citations, tenure, risk aversion, not looking stupid if something blows up, whereas venture capitalists um, allocate their own money more efficiently. So that's something hopefully we can add into Research Hub over time too and kind of, you know, we should be like giving awards for negative results, people who are willing to do that, right? Or um, one of the features we're trying to think about adding in the future is around funding and um, allow anybody to come in and propose ideas, get it crowdsourced, like, you know, in terms of peer reviews or upvotes and people who have capital to allocate, hopefully a lot of people in the crypto space, by the way, <laughs> who have built wealth, <laughs> they're very, they're techno optimists. They want to allocate money to science. 
Um, hopefully this can get more privately funded and we get away from the risk aversion of the NIH and some of these university models. Yeah, maybe I can try and do my best to recap some of the uh, misincentives that produces misknowledge. Uh, Patrick, you were talking about um, just like it's more safe to try and produce positive results, as in like I have a hypothesis and I did some science and my hypothesis has been proved correct. And that is more incented than equivalent science that's trying to uh, uh, prove something against a hypothesis. It's just like people want confirmation bias, right? People want to say like, here's my idea, oh, and it's correct. And there's just like a natural natural incentive to do that kind of science rather than the inverse. And so as a result of that, maybe there's like more false positives as we have three different theories going three different directions and they're all proven true, but they actually conflict with each other. And no one is taking the other side of that trade, for example, to put it into like finance terms. It's like maybe um, uh, a market where short selling is banned. It's just like it's, things just get perversed when you don't have the other side of that market being able to express itself. Uh, and then we've all we all have also talked about um, just uh, Brian, like there's no no one's going for the moon shot. Everyone is just trying to stay keep their cards close to their chest, not trying to take any risks. And I mean, how can you blame them? There are kids to pay for school and there are you know, like mortgages to pay and we don't and job security to, to keep in mind. It really kind of just seems like a Moloch problem, a Moloch trap, a coordination problem where it's just we can't actually incentivize um, trying to find truth, trying to find the North Star. It, it really seems to always boil back down to just economics at the end of the day, capital allocation. We've used capital allocation like three, four or five times so far in this episode. Is it really that simple? Is it really just boiling down to can we fix the financial incentives to fix science? Is that is that a reductive way to put this conversation? I think that's one way to put it. Yeah. And Joyce, you should jump in too. But I, you know, I'm, I'm a believer in free markets. Um, I'm a believer that people allocate their own capital more carefully than they allocate someone else's capital. Um, and so, the market is this beautiful thing that, you know, it's it has this truth serum baked into it, which is like, if you're going to allocate capital to something, did you ultimately produce something that generated revenue um, that paid back? And the people who are good at it get more capital and the people who aren't as good at it get less capital. Mm -hmm. And the minute we put that into a government institution, I think we, we break one of the best mechanisms ever discovered to make progress. And, um, you know, it's true that a lot of science, one of the arguments against this, by the way, is that there needs to be basic research, right? Which would be, um, you know, how do we discover something about the cosmos or the basic laws of physics, like linear, like a, the Stanford linear accelerator. And like, we need to invest in things which have no hope of immediately being commercialized. But, you know, I kind of question that premise a little bit. Um, I think that there are things that have, can be commercialized even out of basic research. Now it might take a decade or two um, but there's enough private citizens with capital now who are thinking about longer time horizons like that. You know, if you're like a basic uh, venture firm that's just trying to invest in SaaS companies and have like, you know, three to five extra money in three to five years or something, maybe you're not going to invest in some of these things. But we've seen people like, you know, Sam Altman or um, the Collison brothers like funded this new ARC Institute, right? Um, we're seeing private sources of capital in Sam Altman's case, you know, he's funding things like nuclear fusion, right? And like, these are in the realm of science fiction, they're, they're research projects. But, you know, or even if you went back to whatever, Elon, you know, with Neuralink or, um, you know, SpaceX, right? Like, these are the kinds of things that would have normally been in the realm of government projects or research um, projects. But it turns out if you have a scientific breakthrough and you can turn it into a product, it's some of the biggest companies on the planet are defined by that. Um, you know, by the way, Coinbase is an example of that too, because it's based on a computer science breakthrough by Satoshi Nakamoto, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it kind of comes, it comes back to like the best companies are based on scientific breakthroughs. Um, so anyway, I, I think there's actually a lot more room to run for private capital being allocated um, towards this than you know we a lot of people think and it can, can actually contribute to basic research as well if you enjoyed all of that then you'll absolutely love the bankless newsletter join over 300,000 fellow readers all for free click below to sign up